Okay, good morning, everybody. This is William from the Fincastle Underground. Today is January 23rd, 2021. It's 921 a.m., and I have a very special guest today, uh, John Lazorek of Tactical Civics. Uh, John Lazorek is a father, teacher, engineer, farmer, and freedom fighter. Born in 1956 near Cleveland, Ohio, his father, a pioneer in business computing applications, taught him to use and value tools that there was nothing he could not learn how to do, and to identify poison ivy. John learned to love the natural world, hiking the invisible wilderness of central New Jersey. He cut his engineering teeth doing a mix of defense and renewable energy-related research in a university environment in the early 1980s. During this time, he started his own business, providing at one end consulting services for university and industrial clients, and at the other, economical repair services for local farmers and industries. He migrated to a mountain farm in West Virginia at the end of the 1980s, seeking to realize his dream of what manufacturing engineers call vertical integration and preppers call self-sufficiency, not only for its survival value, but as a place in which to teach his children where everything comes from, how to see the law and providence of God in all things, and to connect emotionally to the whole of human history. Trying to engineer a righteous and frugal way of life and find a place in a new community, John came up hard against the differences between the beautiful and godly conceptions in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution and the sordid reality of the modern administrative state. He learned about what is and is not law, studying, arguing, and litigating several issues pro se all the way to the Supreme Court of West Virginia, and acquired a deep commitment to the founder's dream of a constitutionally limited republic serving responsible citizens. Is the divinely inspired and, we pray, supported mission of Tactical Civics Institute. He believes he has found the merely human part of the way to finally realize the political side of the founder's dream and his own. And now he joins us today John Lizorek of Tactical Civics. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, John. How are you doing today? Well, it's a beautiful, sunny, cold day up here at 3,000 feet on the mountainside. It is. And you know, I there's so much just reading your bio. You and I have been talking, uh, for those of us, for the audience members that are watching, John and I met back in September here in Botetourt County at a uh, an event sponsored by our local militia at the VFW and you were certainly the most lucid speaker there not to besmirch anybody else but I really honed in on you because you are the authentic genuine article you are the West Virginia mountain man who's putting his money where his mouth is where the rubber meets the road and trying to help us form a more perfect union uh, you want to tell the audience about what your mission exactly is well uh Tactical civics broadly intends to put into op it intends to restore our republic according to the vision of the founders, mm -hmm. which was that uh, government exists for a certain limited number of carefully delineated purposes, which are more conveniently served uh, on a large scale than on a local scale. But the key is for individuals to remain responsible for their lives and in control of their lives. Um, rather than becoming the, the the pawns or worse, the cattle of the power structure. Mm -hmm. And um, there are lots of dimensions to the mission. Uh, we have uh, several uh, targets. Uh, the one that uh, I am most intimately involved with, we call uh, American Militia 2.0. And it uh, goes back to the fact that in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, uh, it is militia which is tasked with executing the law or enforcing the law. Mm -hmm. The Constitution mentions law enforcement in no other context. And that uh, re reflects the genius of the founders who understood that no institution will police itself. So if we, set, if we are to set up an apparatus to take care of certain chores uh, and we delegate to it certain powers, it's essential, and this doesn't have to be my assertion, anybody who watches history uh, will know this, it's essential that we keep tabs on it, we keep it on a leash uh, personally, not through some other uh, institution or agency, which is naturally going to make common cause with another bureaucratic institution or agency. So um, so we have, so American Militia 2.0 aims to uh, teach existing militia groups or people who are interested in 
in the founders' vision of law enforcement, how to do this lawfully, right. uh, which nobody remembers, nobody knows, nobody's done for 150 years. Uh, we have other projects um, going along with the uh, revitalization of militia in its law enforcement function. We have to educate grand juries because mm -hmm. if you're going to discover crime, if you're going to uh, go after it, you need to know where it is and who's doing it. You need an investigative function. And the grand jury is that. It's an institution uh, integral to the to our common law heritage for the past thousand years. A lot of people now think of a grand jury as being a rubber stamp of the judge and the prosecutor, but that's not what it's intended for. Yeah. We have a lovely quote from uh, Supreme Court Justice Scalia. Uh, its power, the grand jury's powers are expansive and its independence is more or less total. Um, so a grand jury would investigate, a militia would execute warrants and so forth. Uh, beyond those things, which really, to me, are the core, because they allow us to actually keep our servants in government within the bounds prescribed for them. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond those, though, we have other other uh, reforms. We have a uh, we're pushing ratification of the original First Amendment proposed for the Constitution, which said that congressional districts may not exceed fifty thousand people. Uh, and that would make an enormous difference because now we have districts of uh, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand people. Uh, we have unresponsive and uh, imperial and imperious so-called representatives in D.C. If we cut the district size down, we will have more uh, representatives who will individually be less powerful. The follow on to that. Well, one of the wonderful things about that is that in the current system, because the districts are so large, an urban concentration basically controls the election of every representative. Mm -hmm. So the the naturally more conservative, uh, more realistic uh, hinterlands of the of the country are more or less completely unrepresented. So if we have small districts, then there will be a much greater diversity of opinion and a diversity of attitude in the Congress. Uh, incidentally, or not incidentally, uh, Congress will then have over six thousand people in it who will not fit in the Capitol building. So. We anticipate that the new, uh, a majority of the new seats will have run uh, on a promise to pass what we call the Bring Congress Home Act, mm -hmm. which will uh, which will force Congress in the future to meet virtually the way we are talking today. Uh, every congressman will have only one office in his or her home district. So we, the people who employ them, will be able to walk into their office and look over their shoulder. They're not going to be uh, in the cesspool of D.C. lap dancing with the lobbyists and whining and dining all night. Um, ordinary people who value their families and their communities and their businesses will be able to serve without abandoning all that to go to D.C. So it's going to change the whole complexion. Right. That sounds, of, um, I don't want to interrupt you. Okay. I mean, I do because I'm about to interrupt you. But you've said so much. I could sit and listen. There's very few people, I might add, that I can sit and listen to because I love talking. Um, it's nice to be on even keel, and actually you probably have even more experience than me with you, the years you've got on me. Um, but you've been talking about, see, as, as my viewers know, but I'll mention again here for new people, I ran for sheriff last year, and I'm a big fan of Richard Mack. I'm a member of the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, and yeah. I considered myself highly knowledgeable on the duties of a sheriff. And this is the first, what, what attracted me to you was when you were talking about impaneling a grand jury with the militia. I had never heard of that anymore. Maybe you could talk more about that because here in Virginia, which as a New Yorker, I, I would have thought that Virginia was the land of the free compared to New York. I had no, and it, it kind of was when I came here in 94, but now you're talking about uh, grand juries indicting a ham sandwich. The Virginia legal system is probably one of the most complicated in the world. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating by that, because when I was running for sheriff, I found out there's more, if Virginia were its own nation, it would have more people incarcerated than, than many large countries put together. And it's got this confusing system of courts and so on and so forth. So maybe if you can really spell out, because I'm still not clear on the whole process, on the role of a grand jury, who these people would be, who would impanel them, and what the militia's role would be in all that. Okay, uh, well, parenthetically, before I go on to that, uh, we love Richard Mack. He's a great guy, mm -hmm. but his civics is wrong. The sheriff is not mentioned in the Constitution anywhere. Right. Uh, sheriff was originally the king's tax collector in England. His title was the Shire Reeve, and and Reeve goes back to a root meaning to tie up. 
-hmm. So um, the sheriff in many places is a good guy, maybe the good guy. He's a well-accepted part of, of American culture, but to say that he is, he is the highest constitutional law enforcement officer is simply not true. He's not in the Constitution at all. Not that it isn't within the powers of the states to, to uh, create that office and to invest it with whatever powers they want. But again, law enforcement uh, is mentioned only once in the Constitution. That's in the context of militia. So as far as how this works goes, um, again, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 uh, describes one of the duties and powers of militia as to execute the law. The three constitutional duties of militia are to execute the law, uh, repel invasions, and suppress insurrections. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can look at uh, a lot of current events in those three contexts. But uh, to go on about the process on the county level, um, we do not propose to replace the existing apparatus of paid law enforcement. But everybody knows that the existing apparatus of paid law enforcement, the, the city, you know, the chief of police, the state police, uh, you know, town cops, uh, sheriff department and deputies, there are a lot of things that they can't do. They mm -hmm. always complain about not enough funding, not enough manpower, uh, and that may or may not be a real limitation. But also, they're all paid. They're all part of the bureaucracy. They all have an institutional motive to protect each other and a personal as well as institutional motive uh, to leave certain things alone. Uh, the, the, I, I'm not accusing any significant percentage of paid law enforcement agencies in the country of being on the take from big, powerful local drug dealers, but it's not unheard of. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the people, are not in the same trap. We, the people serving, serving out our duty as militia, are not getting paid. We are not taking orders from any elected official. We are not part of any bureaucratic apparatus. And we are more numerous than any of these paid agencies can afford to be, or than we can afford to be these paid agencies. So <clears throat> if there is law breaking on the part of school board members, sheriffs, judges, legislators, mayors, or, or uh, powerful drug dealers, uh, militia has the numbers, should have the training, should have the armed power if necessary to go after them. And also of course has the absolute confidence of and credibility with the people because we are coextensive with the people. We are the people. We turn out to take care of our own community. But one of the, the crucial aspects of our system is what we call due process. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no, there is nothing good that comes out of saying, you know, I think he's a bad guy. I'm going to beat him up or I'm going to lock him up. We can't do that because once you, once you sanction that in a society, uh, it, it, it becomes um, it becomes a free for all. So, right. part of your process is to have a process for investigating and for create for finding probable cause to charge someone with a crime, and that is what the grand jury does. The grand jury, uh, historically, we've traced it all the way back to the dooms of King Ethelred around the year 1000 in England. Ethelred was a weak king, <clears throat> and he was put back on the throne by a bunch of English nobles mm -hmm. to replace a Danish king. And he was put back on the throne on condition that he would do certain things, that he would, he would not exercise absolute power. So this is a beautiful early example of we the people uh, dictating what powers our officials will have. And one of the, <clears throat> one of the things in this document called the Dooms of King Ethelred uh, was that in every shire, uh, I think the way it was phrased was the 12 eldest knights will will uh, uh, swear to, pro to to shield no evil man and charge no innocent man. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays grand juries usually have more than 12 in them, but the grand jury structurally is drawn from a ra drawn randomly from a jury pool, just like a petty jury. Mm -hmm. uh, usually a judge will call for the impaneling or the seating of a grand jury. But, uh, and, and a judge, the procedures vary a little bit from state to state. In some states, the, a certain number of citizens are supposed to petition a judge to impanel a grand jury, but it's not really an optional, it's not really an option for the judge. Once the procedure is followed, the grand jury must be impaneled. If the judge refuses to impanel a grand jury, a sheriff can do it. Um, but basically, if there is a, a reasonable suspicion of wrongdoing that enough people share, uh, there is procedure by which a grand jury will be seated. And 
after it is seated, I don't have the Scalia quote in front of me, but after it is seated, <clears throat> it's not under the control of any official. It has the use of the courthouse. Uh, it has subpoena power. Uh, it, the identity of the members are secret so that they're not subject to uh, to pressure or repercussions for the investigation that they're doing. Mm -hmm. They can issue, issue a subpoena. They can issue search warrants. They can issue arrest warrants. They can basically bring in anything or any person for questioning to determine whether they're, whether in their opinion there is or is not probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed. All right. Um, I'm, I'm with you on this. I'm, I've been making notes because I want to interrupt you as sparsely as possible. Uh, feel free. I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with this. I think it's great. Uh, but obviously there's going to be people that if we were to implement something like this, and I'm not looking for problems, uh, oh, there, there'd be people. Was that? It's good to look for problems. That's how. That's 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 part of the part of the as an engineer would call it part of the iterative design process. What can go wrong here? Well, I can. Uh, human nature is the one common denominator. But uh, I did a special. I've worked for many bureaucracies after I got out of the Air Force, and I have come to the conclusion that the biggest enemies in this country, to our freedom, are actually bureaucrats and normie PTA soccer moms, you know, the busybody, what everybody calls Karens nowadays. Uh, those are the real, and people think it's absurd, but that's where the real tyranny comes from, kind of finding this common denominator of keeping everybody safe. To me, that's the biggest enemy to our freedom. But there are those, those same people, if the militia were to <coughs> attempt such a thing, uh, they would call us vigilantes. And I can't imagine that the, um, the tightly held control that the Commonwealth's attorney and the sheriff and some of these people, some localities would go along with it, but many wouldn't. Uh, how do we overcome such a thing? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a process. It's a kind of an engineered stepwise process. In the first place, we look for communities which are more likely to be favorable to this idea. Uh, I was very much impressed with the Botetourt community because the, uh, the people in the meeting that I came out to talk to when we met uh, seem to be dedicated and to be working hard and to have their hearts in the right place and to be to be representative of and well involved with the community. So the first thing you do is you look for a community uh, where you have a militia group or you have a bunch of concerned citizens who are not uh, cussing and swearing, covered with tattoos, running around in the woods looking for somebody to shoot. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not what it's about. Uh, most and, and this is the this is the the propagandistic media image that a lot of people are fed about militia. Right. I was going to say that's a very small right in my experience subset uh, of people. I haven't in in working with militia groups all over the country for over a year now. I haven't met those guys yet. Mm. Uh, the ones that I have seen are are up community to care their pair. Uh, and they're and they are trying to abide by the law and keep their community safe and, 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 and maintain their rights. So first thing we look for is a good group. We look for a good group which works hard within the community to make sure that it is supported not only by its own members but by the little the little old ladies they bring firewood to, by the the uh, by the school teachers, by the business owners, by everybody who sees that they are an asset to the community. Some communities have members of their county governing body who are constitutionalists, surprise, surprise. Not enough of them, but some of them do. So right. we look for a community with a, with a squeaky clean, <clears throat> involved, a well community supported militia group. We look for a, a, uh, a county with a governing body, at least some of whose members are favorable to this. We raise a lot of support. We have an ordinance that Tactical Civics has put together by which the county recognizes militia, basically gives it the same recognition that the federal government and state governments are supposed to give, but have unlawfully withheld. Mm -hmm. uh, so once this ordinance is passed, again, I will not advise groups in the first county to do anything, to go after anybody, until several of the surrounding counties have the same program up and running. Maybe a bunch of counties in the same state, maybe a, maybe a county or two across the border, because ultimately, it's about it's not a it's not a majority thing, but it's about having a credible number of people. Mm -hmm. It's about having a certain level of community acceptance. So <clears throat> this is a question I often get. If we play out scenarios, let's say the grand let's let's say uh, uh, the militia group is talking and they say, well, you know, we've had got this had this bad egg on the school board for years. All the money's going into his son-in-law's pocket. So they file a present they they 
uh, petition the judge, they get a grand jury seated. They file a presentment with the grand jury saying, you need to look into this guy. Grand jury looks into this guy uh, and they find probable cause. So they hand down an indictment and uh, the militia goes out and arrests him. And the prosecutor says, in my in my august prosecutorial discretion, I'm going to drop these charges. Mm -hmm. Well, the grand jury says, hey, we did our homework. The, this prosecutor must have a motive for having dropped these charges. Maybe he's in on it. So all of a sudden, the grand jury in, investigates the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Maybe the grand jury says, well, we need to see the prosecutor's computers. We need to see what's, see what's in his file cabinets. So the grand jury uh, swears out a search warrant for the prosecutor's office. Obviously, the sheriff's not going to ser serve that warrant. Right. State police are going to serve the warrant. So the militia serves the warrant. So this does two things. One is it, it lawfully follows an evidence trail mm -hmm. to see if the prosecutor is in on some kind of criminal activity. And also, quite frankly, it puts a hell of a lot of emotional pressure on the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. This process can work its way all the way up the chain. If the prosecutor comes around, or if you go through whatever the procedure is laid out in your particular state to replace the prosecutor with one who's not prejudiced or not involved or whatever, and you get to the judge, and the judge winks at, winks at the school board member and says, case dismissed, grand jury starts to investigate the judge. So this process is probably not going to work, you know, click, click, click the first time it's tried in the first place. But if you have built the infrastructure or the groundwork of support and you have the network, the pressure that will be brought to bear on bad actors will rapidly grow. It will grow across county lines. It will grow across state lines. And I think people will rapidly be able to see the power that they have and see the pressure that they can exert against the entrenched criminality in their government. Well, so, you know, uh, I would say that this is now more possible than it's ever been, actually. If you had told me this even 10 years ago, I, I would say, well, that's nice. But now I would say it's actually more possible. You can't accuse people of not being involved at this point. And uh, like I said, you've been doing this longer than me. Have you noticed an uptick in involved citizens? I, I certainly have people talking about the Constitution more. And uh, it, people say all the time, America needs a civics lesson. Well, the past two years have been the civics lesson that we need. People finding out the limits <clears throat> of executive orders, the powers of a sheriff, the powers of a mayor. Well, the last couple of years have been the have been the bad part of the civics lesson. The good mm -hmm. part of the civics lesson is on our website. <laughs> right. Well, I'm, and I'll give that out to everybody before we go. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about is that it seems that the other two obstacles to this, the, the, again, human nature, not really understanding what it is you're proposing here, and um, also what what constitutes a crime. I don't know how you feel about this, but. To me, as a society, with our industrial prison system and everything uh, that I've been talking about for years, we, we have a, a fixation with, with crimes that are, in fact, non-crimes, while people like the hypothetical prosecutor you were mentioning earlier get away with all this. Like, I'll say it right here and now. Anybody who wanted to look at the budget of this county, Botetourt County that I'm in, uh, there's there's massive hemorrhaging money, just hemorrhaging money. But because they use bureaucratic accounting techniques, uh, it's like, oh, we're great. We're in the black. The county's never been better. When the reality is we're basically a, a sinking ship. You know, so uh, where was I going? Th that's the kind of thing I was talking about. The sort of white collar malfeasance by public officials. That stuff always seems to slide under the rug. Whereas you got some, some veteran who might be hooked on, on heroin or junk or something like that. And uh, they have no problem putting him in the making him a felon and locking him away or something like that. When really his li his life choices are basically just self destructive addiction. Um, so f the the obstacle that I'm talking, what I, my basic point is that uh, the idea of what crime is has been grossly perverted in America. You've heard uh, you've heard the phrases <clears throat> malum prohibitum and malum in se. Uh, yeah. Malum in se means bad in itself. Uh, I might say something which is bad under under God's law. A malum prohibitum is something which is bad only because it is prohibited. Mm -hmm. So there are two classes of law. Uh, humans make law uh, to uh, to enforce to, to to discourage people or punish people and or punish people from doing things that are bad bad in and of themselves, mm -hmm. like killing somebody else or beating someone up or stealing. Uh, and then they make up crimes 
you know, we don't want you to eat this particular mushroom or smoke that particular weed. Right. I do not personally approve of any form of drug taking. I don't take aspirin myself, but I think that's a personal choice. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of other things tied into this. So if you talk about, we, we can't, um, we already have legislative processes. Uh, we're not proposing to alter the legislative process, but if a legislator uh, who is our servant decides to create a crime to make himself look good, um, we really have to rely on the people to see through that and not elect him the next time. If we have uh, if we have a legislator who invents a crime like adding onto your house without uh, getting a building permit mm -hmm. uh, because he wants more control and he wants to get more revenue in the treasury, then conceivably, as we the people become more and more aware of the fact that we erected this system of law to protect our rights and provide the right of property is key, uh, we might decide that uh, setting up a law which interferes with my ability to add on to my house is actually theft. It's a form of a form of stealing from me a part of my bundle of property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the concept of crime, yes, it's a it's a I mean, the, the broad the broad split is between uh, uh, malum prohibitum and malum in se. Right. And as people value their freedom more, if we can help people remember to value their freedom and more, maybe, more, maybe we can get people to realize that uh, it's not really crime unless it hurts someone else. Right. Well, the, I don't want to stay, be hyper focused on this, but I think it's <laughs> at the crux of what you're talking about, right. because I've made no secret about the fact I was an alcoholic for years. Unfortunately, it's made me who I am. But I, I became a felon as a result of it, never hurt or killed anybody. And the reason I'm focusing on, on this and crime and so much is because the consequences are disastrous. It turns the law into a, a restraining apparatus of the government to a cudgel against the people, uh, right. creating this whole felony thing, especially w in the age of computers. It creates a subclass of citizens. You will never get away from that. I could be, it could be 20 years from now. I could be driving through uh, Arizona, uh, certainly not California. I could be driving through Arizona. I get pulled over for a taillight. And the fact that I was an alcoholic in 2005 is going to come back to haunt me. And they're going to call like five cops around me. And, um, and you know, and it, it's specifically in my mind against the 14th Amendment, like I said, creating a secondary class of citizens. And uh, these sort of victimless crimes turn the law into a cudgel against the people. Right. Well, that's and, and there is a certain cynically, I have to say, there's a certain purposeful purposefulness to that. If you and I, I'm sure there's a quote about this that I should know off the top of my head. But if you if you erect a dense enough net of laws uh, by selective enforcement, you can control everybody mm -hmm. because the people that you don't want to go after, uh, you ignore them when they're when they're violating this ridiculous some, some of these ridiculous laws. But you always have one. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can nail anyone that you want at any moment if you're the power structure. And and that now that there are other ways, there are other ways to fight that. Um, probably a lot of people are familiar with an outfit called the Fully Informed Jury Association. One of the ways in which bad laws can be obstructed in their operation is if juries will refuse to convict under them. Oh, I've been a big fan of jury nullification for years, yep. ever since I found out about the Federal Reserve and tax law and things like that. Um, I, again, I hate to be so nebulous about the, the root problems we have here, and you may disagree with me on this, but I've noticed that there's an underpinning, a belief underpinning everything that um, I don't think people have even acknowledged. But if you look at the actions that we take as a society in mass, uh, there seems to be this idea that if left alone, human beings will devolve into chaos and disorder. And to me, that's simply not true. I, as a sociologist, I have a background in sociology. I'm fascinated with spontaneous order, like when a traffic light goes out and people are able to handle it. What built our society and our republic other than people being left alone to their own devices? I think that's when we get the most dynamic and, um, and, and beautiful, if I may, and beautiful uh, aspects of humanity. And there's this, there's this mistrust of humanity. I think that chaos is very hard to come by it because it, it's so easy to cause chaos i can think about five different ways to blow up a gas station right now it, it's just not happening most human interactions are peaceable and normal 
and there's not a lot of weirdos running out there by and large. And if it weren't for the media blowing these events up in our face, you know, the world's basically a peaceful place, John. One interesting thing to remember that I always like to remember is that people tend to see the world around them through the lens of their own characters. Mm -hmm. uh, often someone who is very frightened about having something stolen from him has a thievish heart himself. Mm. Uh, people who like to have power over other people, uh, that, is not, that is not a good motive. Those people are always looking for a way to take advantage of other people. So they project that on everyone around them and then they start saying, well, if you don't let me carry this big stick to hit people with, then someone might rob you or someone might beat you up. So the people who are looking for positions of control over their fellows, it is in their interest to gin up everyone's fear of each other. Mm -hmm. so I think you're right. Uh, most people are good people. Most people want to co cooperate constructively. Those good impulses are fostered by uh, an environment which is not too safe. One of the things which bu always builds a community is a, a natural situation where people have to cooperate to survive. Mm -hmm. That's one of, the, one of the unique factors which came together in the era of this country's founding to form the society we had, the fact that we were a frontier civilization. Right. So, No, it's, um, yeah, I, I, as I said, I have a background in sociology. So you, I try and look at what, the, uh, what we're doing as a society, the actions we're taking, and then try and deconstruct the ideas behind them. And like I said, uh, in order to feed the massive prison system that we have, basically everything's illegal. You know, I, I, a lot of people that are in my position the system relies on shame. They don't count on you to go out and tell people you're a felon. But I've been telling my, my story specifically because what happened when you become a felon, people don't realize they take your rights away. And as, as George Carlin and others said, rights aren't rights if they can be taken away. Uh, they take your, your right to vote away, hold office, serve on a jury, your right to, certainly your right to carry a firearm. And then, yeah, you can get them back incrementally after that. But the average normie out there, the PTA, the proverbial PTA soccer mom that we always make fun of that's out there is like, well, this person, surely they deserve to be in jail. And I can tell you from experience, at least 98, 99 percent of the people that are in local jails and stuff, they'd be no threat to the average citizen if they were walking the street. They get snatched up off the, off the street for some victimless crime. Uh, now that they're in jail, they can't go out and earn a living. They've been robbed of their ability to make a living. They may lose, if they're a single parent, their, their children may go into foster care. Uh, while they're in jail, if they don't have a job and they're not making income, they're going to lose their house or their apartment or whatever. Now when they get out into society, now they have to do desperate, dangerous things to survive. And while all this is going on, bureaucrats, elected officials, and members of our government are getting away with massive exploitive crimes against the people. I don't know if there's a question in there. I just rant sometimes. And I know we have <laughs> well, to kind of wrap it up too, John. You're right. The, uh, the, the serious criminality in terms of, of the amounts of money stolen, in terms of the numbers of people uh, injured and killed and lives destroyed, uh, the big criminals are in government mm -hmm. all over the world. And it's been, that, that has been the rule of human history. Yeah, there was a story here in Virginia a guy just settled with the Commonwealth. They kept him in solitary confinement for 20 years for no reason other than they basically had a, a grudge against the guy. Um, I don't know all the particulars of the story, but they're paying out now. So much well, inhumanity happens under the turning, banner. Turning it back around to, uh, to the drum that I'm beating on, uh, we, need, we need to roll the bureaucracy back, but we need public servants to recognize that that's their job. Mm -hmm. We need public servants who recognize what the founders believed, which is that government is at best a necessary evil. Uh, it is to be kept uh, bound down with the chains of the Constitution. That's another quote whose uh, person who said it. I should remember, but I don't. Um, if we have effective enforcement of the law against our servants, then little by little, much of what you say will change because a different character of person will seek the jobs. Uh, Violating the Constitution is the crime that every official knows he will get away with. Mm. That's the fact of modern life. It shouldn't be that way. If we, the people, according to the blueprint that our founders wrote, will, will make that untrue, will make the law enforceable against the people to whom we delegate certain tasks again, then in a relatively short period of time, the bad guys will decide, 
I don't want a government job. I'm going to jail mm -hmm. if I if I if I try to get a government job and misuse that power. I'm better off just picking pockets or God forbid getting a real job. Oh uh, yeah. Really, we can change the whole we can change the whole character of the government by making crime and government no longer pay. Right. And it, and like I said from working at Social Security and the VA, they get sweetheart deals. It's a unionized right. job. If you work over eight hours in a day, it counts as overtime. The benefits you could never, and I've had a lot of jobs, benefits I could never get in the private sector because they would bankrupt any company that tried to offer them. Right. So, well, I yeah. don't, I know you do have to, you wanted to get out of here in a timely fashion. I've got your contact information up on the screen right now. You've got www.tacticalcivics.com. Your email address, john.lezorek at tacticalcivics.com. Is there anything else, any final messages you had for the, the crew? Well, only that what we are trying to do gets more necessary all the time. We, we have a, a horrific example of the fact that the law apparently no longer binds our government at all. Mm. Uh, the, the events of the last couple of months uh, are disheartening and frightening, but Hopefully we can turn them to good. Hopefully they will wake up enough people. There's a funny, it's funny, there's a phrase that everybody has heard. Someone will wag a finger and say, don't take the law into your own hands. Mm. But actually that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a rotten phrase because what someone is cautioning you against when they say that is against acting lawlessly. Mm. But having the law in our own hands is precisely what we did in 1776. It is precisely what we wrote down in the Constitution that was ratified by 1789. Mm -hmm. We must hold the law, not our whim, not some, some fantasy of, of power or control, but the law is what we should and must hold in our own hands if we are to maintain a society in which we are free. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what um, law, if it is correct law, is what makes us free by protecting our rights. That is, the, that is the fundamental justifying purpose of law and government is to protect the individual because the individual is the reality of humanity. Many, many individuals. Right. Uh, and we need to remember that and, and protect what is ours. And I think, again, <laughs> wrapping it up with a pitch, I have been around the block. I have spent a lot of time in courts. I've spent a lot of time doing research. I've looked at a lot of different websites and groups saying save this and save that and save the republic and save the constitution nobody has a plan like mm -hmm. tactical civics does right it covers all the bases it's lawful it's peaceful we need to get started uh, no that that exciting. and uh, term limits uh base, real real in the bureaucracies term limits would be enormously helpful that would be another baseline thing that would make a huge difference Term limits, I think, would come along with a different kind of legislation. Would come along with, see, the reason we don't have support for term limits on the on the lawmakers' end now is that it's too juicy a career. Mm -hmm. The people who who seek these jobs mostly want a fat, juicy career where they can break the law with impunity. Why would they want, ever want a term limit? If if crime, if if nobody gets away with criminal behavior in office anymore then the only people who will want to run for those offices will be people who, surprise, surprise, are not criminals. Right. They will want, they will want to get back to their homes. They will want to get back to their businesses. They will, they will serve their communities in these positions for a, for a term or two, for a, for a period of time. And then they will say, I've had enough. Let somebody else take their turn. It should not, public service should not be a, public service in the paid sense must not be a career. Mm -hmm. And we don't really need legislation to end that. We need law enforcement to change the kind of people who seek those jobs. No, I agree. And like one final point, just to talk about what you said earlier about taking the law into your own hands. I think this speaks to a bigger problem. And when people say don't take the law into your own hands, it's, it's um, symptomatic of this idea that there's somebody else that's always going to handle it. That these mystery professionals, that somewhere there are professionals, which don't exist, I might tell you. <laughs> it might be a professional a facade. But the, the idea that, oh, no, don't do this yourself. There's trusted professionals out there. And one of the things I've learned is that the, the people that I distrust the most are the people that were um, sold to us when I was a child growing up in the, the early 80s. You know, the, 
uh, the trusted priest or the friendly teacher or the school guidance counselor. Like, these people don't exist anymore. You know, you have to root them out. Uh, like there may be quality individuals in those roles, but as an institution, they're all cracked. Again, the institution, the institution fosters criminality uh, because it, it protect once you're in, you're protected. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to exercise powers you don't lawfully have. Uh, people need to be responsible for themselves. People need to stand on their own. They shouldn't say, well, I'm a good guy because I wear blue or I'm a good guy because I'm a school teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to be held responsible for doing the right thing as individuals. Well, I agree. I agree. And it's, the madness is, um, I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we're in a society now where basically my grocery store is an arm of the government here in Virginia, essentially. I never thought we'd be living in that. But I won't keep you unless there's anything you have the final word, if there's anything that you wanted to say or get out there. I'm sure we'll, well do this again. Yes, we should. We, we've got lots of other directions to go off and it will be fun to do it again. But um, yeah, all I will all I will say is if you're concerned about this stuff and you you the listener want to do more than complain, if you want to have a, a, a glorious sense of, of, of power and hope, uh, check out the Tactical Civics Organization. I, we, we can get it done. We just need you. All right. Fantastic. Hang with me Thank for just a, just a second, John. I'm going to end the show. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Definitely check out John with Tactical Civics. Um, you've got his co contact information that's been up on the screen. Thank you for tuning into the FinCast Underground, and I will talk with all of you later.